Um, I'd like to talk about uh, something that we've done at Mesquite Community College uh, and do with classroom design. In particular, I think there's a, a major variable in how we teach that's most often ignored. And it's ignored a lot of the times because math classes are some of the last ones to be scheduled into rooms, right? You can teach math in any room, they say, right? Well, you know how it is, like, if you have a certain way of doing something, uh, like, let's say you use a lot of computer resources, and you get scheduled into a room with no computer, suddenly you're forced into a teaching method you're not uh, comfortable with, you know, having to abandon those resources. So I think there's actually three, there's certainly lots of variables within these, but there's three major variables in, in what happens in classroom learning, not online, but just classroom learning. And those are the instructors and all sorts of variables related to the instructors. The students, we all know that's a very important variable, although the media likes to ignore that one completely. The students are a very important variable, but also I think the classroom, which is the most ignored variable, is huge in what happens in classroom learning. So the first thing I want to ask you is, I'm going to show you some pictures of classrooms, and I want you to tell me what these classrooms say, both to the instructor and to the students when they walk into the room. Um, so what instructions are the classrooms sending? Okay? So I'm just going to show you three pictures, and then I'll ask. So what do the classrooms say to the students? You have to pay attention. You don't have to pay attention to not sure. But what are they expecting to happen? Do these classrooms here, do they say group work? No. What kind of, what, are you, what is a student who walks into one of these classrooms expecting? Lecture, right? Lecture. And that's really important because what is an instructor? You know, like, if you're the instructor and you walk into the classroom, what are you expecting? Lecture. It looks just the same as when you went to school and you lectured, right? So the classrooms are all sending that message. And so even when we have innovative instructors who decide to do more active things, they are constantly being fought against by the classroom. You, know, you can come in and say, we're going to do group work, but you've got to move all the tables to do it, right? Or you've got to get the students to climb over tables to have a group. The, the whole classroom fights against you. So um, instructors are encouraged to have students do more active things, but the classroom sent a very clear message to the students to fight against it. And they send a very clear message to the instructors to fight against it, because if you have to walk into a classroom and spend the first five minutes rearranging the classroom and the last five minutes putting it back for the next instructor who's going to be irritated that you moved it, that's ten minutes of class time. And how many of us really have the like drive to do that every single class, several times a day, just to do this thing we're supposed to do, which is more active learning? Right? Very few of us can like maintain that over time. Um, so what if the classroom sends a different message instead? both to the instructors and to the students. I'm going to show you different, so actually some of the exact same rooms, but set up a little bit differently. So that's the front, and this is actually looking from the front back, okay? So this is a very different, it no longer, I mean, it still has a clear front to the room, because I think with math, there has to be some kind of front to the room for demonstration purposes, but um, the students, when they come into this room, it's really odd to them at first. Uh, because, for one thing, they have a hard time telling where the front is in some of these rooms because there are whiteboards and all the walls. You saw them in our other rooms too, but our rooms are specifically designed this right now. Um, and we have these hack round tables, which puts them naturally into groups, right? And you know what happens in a normal classroom with all those rows? You say, okay, find a partner, and most of the students do this. Right? It, I mean, they have to actually make a friend to have a partner, right? Well, at these tables, there's no question who the partners are, right? When I say work with your group, there's absolutely no question anymore what the group is. They're naturally formed. If I say find a partner, well, there's two partners here and two partners there, right? But that's it. You're done. Right? So um, the natural group formation is huge. Um, we have our rooms designed with a smart board at the front and a computer station. It's not necessary, actually. It's the tables are more important than the smart board, but I'll get you that in a second. Um, so we call these math elites, um, this engaged learning, interactive technology environment, and the most important here is the top part, the engaged learning. We gave it a name because we found that administrators are more likely to fund something with a name they can put in the annual report. <laughs> not kidding about that. You know how it goes, right? We have a new library and we put in two math elites, 
Nobody knows what mathlene is, but they're impressed that, you know, we did it. So here are the main ingredients, and I would say that these are in order of importance. These are all only handouts that are going around. And if you just Google mathlene leads, you'll find plenty of stuff on it that we have put up on the internet. Um, so the most important thing is walls of whiteboards. You start with nothing else, you start with that, and I'll show you why in a sec. These half round tables, uh, document camera, projector, computer, and speakers, and then this last one I think is kind of optional. If you can get it, good. You always put it in the proposal just for the heck of it, you know, something kind of high end just to see if you get it. But, um, but we have found actually them to be quite useful. So we're going to start with, I'm going to walk through the first three ingredients because I think they're the most important. At this point, I think computers and speakers are something everybody wants anyway, so I'm probably not going to talk about that. But uh, lots of whiteboards. i got to sell you on the other things because you'll have to sell somebody else on so um, this is uh, some some of the pictures are not so. Some of them are pictures from our pictures. So it is a video. So I wanted to show you what these rooms look like. And there's not going to be sound in these, but you can just see if there was, you'll hear a lot of noise. Right? Uh -huh. um, so these are my students, and they spend a good portion of class time now doing this instead of being in their seats. They work where I would normally work examples for them, the trained monkey in front of the room. They are now the ones doing the work. Okay, so there's one. That's just a photo. So they have to talk to each other. They always work in pairs. They have to talk to each other. Um, one person does one problem, and then I give them another problem. They switch. They're all doing the same problem, by the way. You can tell from the vantage point that I have there at the front of the room. I can see what all of them are doing at once, right? I can walk and troubleshoot where I see there's bad notation happening or where somebody's gotten really off track. They also look around the room to see what other groups are doing to look for good ideas and things like that, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's a learning environment, right? It's really funny when somebody does something wrong and then that gets passed around the room, and I usually let it happen just to prove a point uh, later on when everything goes wrong. Here's just one more. So you notice this is the same girl who used to be used to be over there, and now she's over here. Well, there's also something I do, which I'll show you in a second, called traveling, so that departments change all the time. And, and in a given two-hour session, um, if it's a review day, they will make it all the way around the room at least once um, with different partners. So, but you'll notice that they are the ones actively doing the math in the room now. So this is why I think white cards are one of the most important things. And you'll see the groups kind of start to huddle together and talk, and they're discussing the math. And here's one where they've got the calculators out. Um, this is a different class. It's math with elementary teachers. So they sometimes have to explain things to each other out loud. Um, but look, look at the like determination, <laughs> you know. And, and I walk around the room with a red marker, and I correct. I spend most of my time just correcting notation. Like those things we can't get students to do very well on their own. So by, by the time we're like three weeks into the semester. They see me coming, they all look at what they're doing to do what? <laughs> Fix anything that's wrong, right? Perfect. Right, their notation on test starts to get much, much better. I gave a teach calculus this semester, so I gave that test on limits. And you know how many times you have to write the limit as age approaches zero? I wrote it twice on a class of 32 students. Right? So, uh, I mean, their, their notation just gets tons better. Uh, their, their thinking process is better because they're talking out loud, and they love coming to class. Like, it's bizarre. They'll say, well, we like to come to this class, and I say, well, why do you like to come to this class? It's calculus. This is the only class where we get to do something, they say. Calculus? This is the only class where they get to do something? Yeah, so, anyways, and I love, you know, just seeing them teaching each other on, on the board. So I wanted to show you the traveling thing. Um, the key to this, I think, is that you don't have dysfunctional partnerships all the time. You know how it is when you tell somebody to find a partner, they find the worst person they could possibly be partnered with. Okay, so this is, I asked them to demonstrate traveling for me through the video, so see the manage marching along here. So when I say it's time to, when we've done that, we've finished the problem, I'll say it's time to travel, and one person from each group will walk to the next partner. So one person stays put, one person travels. And you know, after the first time, they, they get pretty used to it, and I just say, all right, it's time to travel, and that person just moves on. I also will always say, even at this point in the semester, make sure you introduce yourself to your partner. They're just very bad at it, this whole like, introduction, saying hello, you know, and then they get them talking to each other. Um, so uh, they see these guys here about to introduce themselves to each other. Um, but it means that 
you don't have those dysfunctional partnerships that go on forever, um, which makes it really nice. So the next ingredient in here, I think that's really important, is these half round tables. If you look them up on the internet, they're actually technically called kidney-shaped tables. Um, and just look at how they're working at these tables. It's not what you see at rectangular tables or circular tables, which tend to put too much space between the students. So you'll see them all kind of like huddled in. Look at this group over here, like completely tucked into what they're doing. Um, there's a couple tricks to this. It helps to only give them one copy of something. <laughs> um, because if you give them four copies, they'll all work individually. Um, but it gives you the chance that you have this nice surface work area so they're using, um, a, I think we're doing a sorting activity here, it's a puzzle. Um, that's a beginning algebra class. This is a math for elementary teachers class. Those of you who were at my presentation yesterday, you can see they're playing a block game. This is before I had marbles, so they had a, a, a structure or little player cards to use. I particularly like this picture because what's happened to their computers? Uh, they're open, I mean, they have them, but the more interesting thing is what's happening together, right? Um, when they're doing something active. There's a calculus class playing another it's a puzzle about um, sorting graphs, so they have to sort all these uh, graphs right here to the functions that go with them without using a calculator. Um, and again, you can see they're all kind of tucked into working together. The half round tables nicely point them all in the same direction with whatever they're looking at being relatively upright under the hood of the group. And that's something that circular tables or rectangular tables don't do. So when we found these kidney shaped tables, we knew these were the tables for us. Um, so there's just some more features. The tables also make it a heck of a lot easier to get to the boards. And just to show you that, I'm going to show you that exact same room, that exact same scene, with the way it used to look, which is with those rows in it. And we literally had to put our butts down on the tables and climb over them to get to the boards in the back or on the sides. And me walking around the room to correct notation, I had to climb over the tables too. We couldn't get past students standing right here. We just had to go over the tables. So I mean, th these, these, the way these classrooms set up are a significant deterrent to doing these active things. So the third thing I think that's fairly key in these rooms, and the hardest sell for like administrators because it just doesn't seem much different than an overhead, but it really is. The document camera, I just want to show you several things I use before. One is you can simply, if you have worksheets or whatever, you can just throw them on there. You don't have to make acetates and everything else. Um, you can show manipulatives and how they're being used directly on the document camera to the room. You can show a problem out of a textbook. By the way, binder clips are very useful for keeping the pages from falling down. Um, so you can show a problem directly from the textbook, which is nice. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff with portable whiteboards and manipulatives if you need a background to write on. Um, and you can also, I don't know if you notice this in the picture, but you can take a, a small video camera and clip it to the document camera to record what happens on the screen down here. So, um, and by the way, the, the accessory I used to do that is a hairband. <laughs> Works perfectly. You couldn't ask for anything nicer. Just one of those flexible hairbands you find at a drugstore. A rubber band would probably work too. So I wanted to show you what that, um, a little bit about what that might look like. I'm just going to jump into the video here. You won't hear me talking, so I need to. So you can see this is pointing down on the document camera, it's somewhere in the middle of the video. So this is what's being recorded by that little camera and I'm talking in the background. So you can capture what's happening in that very physical space very easily that way. For some of the expensive document cameras, we'll have, um, you know, you can hook them right into a computer or we can go that expensive. So I'm doing it the old-fashioned way here, okay? So uh, anyways, you can also demonstrate calculators side by side. So if you have a classroom full of students with multiple calculators and you have those calculators, when you put them both on the document camera, they both show on the screen. Right? You don't have to keep switching back and forth, switching back and forth. You can point to something on one, point to something on the other, and you're done. You see some of you just brought the whole concept right there. Okay, so I want to spend my last two minutes talking about how you get your own math week. Method number one I call the boiled frog method. I'm sure you're all familiar with the boiled frog who just sits in the pot and gradually gets cooked. So this is your administration being cooked, not you. You start with baby steps. You say, well, 
I have a room, it doesn't have enough whiteboards. I'll ask for one more wall of whiteboards or two more walls, you know. You make friends with your custodians, generally campuses buy in bulk, which means that somewhere on campus there is a room full of whiteboards at the end of the year and nobody has claimed them, right? Find where that room is, claim them. The custodians will get used to just asking you where you want them at the end of the year. Um, just to show you that this is um, from Treasure Valley Community College, she realized she had chalkboards running all over the room and started using sidewalk chalk to do this in her classes. This is our Pat Throat's classes. West York Community College, same thing. He discovered that, well, for one thing, those rectangular tables, he could at least make them into table tables instead of rows. And I uh, started utilizing the boards in the room, started borrowing boards from places he found on campus. So this is the, the way you start. It's how we started, too. We at least got the whiteboards up. Uh, the second method is to uh, dream big and submit a budget request. Every college has a budget request season. If you don't ask for it during the right season, you'll never get it. Okay? Here's how to make it work. First, identify your target areas. Find rooms that are already used almost exclusively by math. Prove it. Run the stats. Ask somebody for the numbers. I mean, we found these two rooms that we asked for were already almost exclusively math classrooms. It's really easy to sell somebody on a redesign and making a class specifically for math if it's already specifically for math, okay? And don't let them tell you they don't do that. Chemistry labs always get scheduled into chemistry rooms. Physics labs always get scheduled into physics rooms. There is a way to do it on your campus system, okay? Don't let them tell you there's not. Uh, I would also recommend that in your proposals, you include pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. It sells the concept more than anything else. Think of the way that that classroom used to look, and we literally used, you know, a, a software program to designate where things were going to go in that picture, and diagrams of what those rooms would look like, okay? I'd ask for two rooms. You all know why? Because you'll get one, right? In this budget, in this budget climate, you have to give your administrator something to cut to make it more reasonable. So, you know, ask for two rooms. Believe it or not, we got two. Right? So you could get lucky and get two, but you might as well ask for two so that your administrator acting the way they have to can say, well, we're only giving you half of what you want, right? Um, name the room. It's very important. You can call them athletes just like we do. They can go Google it, and they'll find stuff on them on the internet, which will help very much. Um, so they, they like to show up. Our, our president, every time he runs people through the college, he stops by to show them our rooms. Why? Because after we had them built, I sent pictures of students in the rooms to every administrator. They know exactly where to stop to show up interesting things happening on campus. Right? They love it. So um, there's one question I know will come up, and I'm going to answer it before it asks. How do you do tests in a room like this? So somebody asked. How do you do tests in a room like this? It's very simple. Take your normal four-page test, you break it into two parts, call one part A and one part B, you pass it out every other student. You never have the same part of the test as the person next to you. When they're done with the part they're on, they come swap you for the other part. You can't copy out the people next to them. You don't have to make multiple versions of things. Just make the exact same test you normally would and split it into two pieces. That also gives you the possibility of having a calculator, no calculator, notes, no notes, card, things like that. But it's much easier than writing multiple versions. It works just fine. It doesn't require any extra work. Okay? Timing would help. What? Timing. Oh, it works out. I usually warn them halfway through class. If they, you know, if you haven't switched yet, you might want to. I let them switch back at the end if they have extra time. It's fine. It's just all really one test. But I mean, they know why I do it, so they don't have the same thing as the person next to them. Nobody really. Not a problem. Any other questions before we run out of time? Yeah? No, we didn't lose a single seat in the room. Seats 30 people. So it sat 30 people before. It's actually more spacious now because they're a little bit closer together in those spaces. Yes? Right. We just didn't want that whole rearranging thing to have to happen, yeah. so we decided on the set. So, anyways, it's time to get Yep.